You know the hardest thing about living with the iPhone 10 in 2023? My brother, Frank. <laughs> hey, it's my poor brother. I mean, younger brother, Drew. What are you up to today? What tech you rocking now? Hey, Frank. I uh, actually downgraded recently to the uh, iPhone 10, and I found it really <laughs> insightful as well. iPhone 10? Are you kidding? My beautiful baby is younger than your iPhone 10. I can't believe you're not rocking a one terabyte space black 14 Pro Max. Clearly the best phone of all time. And also, what happened to your Apple Watch Ultra? Like, what? Wh where's your watch? Yeah, that, that's a great watch, Frank. I just didn't really see the need for it. I'm very happy with my Series 7. Oh, God. That is so 2021. I don't know how you can live with yourself. The bezels are, are, are thinner. I find myself enjoying it. But, you know, sometimes there's something good about using older tech. You know, to be frank, Drew, wh wh which yeah, I am. Yeah, he, he says that a lot. I just don't think you're appreciating Apple in the way you're supposed to. You know, in our family, we are supposed to all be blue bubbles. We are all supposed to buy the latest iPad. Frank, we talked about this. The M2 iPad Pros are so similar to the... <gasps> don't tell Tell me you didn't buy the M2 Max 16-inch MacBook Pro with 96 gigs of unified memory. No, Frank, there, there was nothing wrong with my old MacBook Pro. I, I, I didn't see a need to upgrade. The speeds weren't that <gasps> much different. What's wrong, Drew? Are you guys in trouble? Do, do, do you need some help? Like, you want me to buy the tech for you? I can buy it for you. I've got the money. Frank, it's not that bad, okay? I'm just trying to enjoy life with tech that's cheaper that already exists. And to think I put you as my emergency contact in my health app. Yeah, I'll be updating that. I don't think we can talk anymore. You're on your way to becoming a green bubble. Frank! Oh, okay, let's begin. So this has basically plagued my comment section lately. Everyone wants to know how the iPhone 10 is doing in 2023. I appreciate your guys' enthusiasm, especially during this lull season where the tech news is drier than toast. But honestly, the most impressive thing to me about the iPhone 10 now using it for the past three weeks in 2023 is the OLED display. You know, it was kind of state of the art for at least an iPhone at the time. And a lot of people's criticisms when the iPhone 10 first dropped was like, OLED, come on, Android has had this for years. But we've noticed that there's lots of burn-in problems with those earlier Android phones that didn't age all that well. And that's kind of the beauty of trying to review older tech is that there's absolutely zero burn-in on this iPhone 10, And I don't even have auto lock on. So if I don't intentionally turn the display off on this phone, it will just stay on for extended periods. And that's how my mom used it. That's how I used it for the first year I had it. And sure, it's definitely not as bright. It doesn't have ProMotion. It doesn't have an always-on display. Unless you go into settings and, you know, turn it off. But the fact that there's no trace of burn-in even on that little home bar at the bottom after six years of being used daily and, by the way, all the time, like this was not a phone that my mom or me went easy on. We got a lot of use out of it and I'm still getting a lot of use out of it. And for most indoor experiences, it's still a very rich, very vibrant display. Those OLED pixels go all the way off. And sure, it doesn't get too bright in direct sunlight and future generations of iPhone have adapted to that, but it's not at the end of the world, I've noticed in my day-to-day -day life. I can still typically, you know, either just hold my hand over the display, still see everything okay, and it's not like the display is invisible in broad daylight. It's just a little bit harder to see, but I'm young, my eyes are good, I guess, so it's not a big deal. I'm just impressed with how the overall layout of having the notch and the gesture controls hasn't really changed too much from my iPhone 13 Pro Max going all the way back to the iPhone 10. It still doesn't feel that different. It still feels inherently iPhone and iOS friendly, being able to switch between apps very quickly, and activating control center from the top corner. Yeah, even though it's six years old, I still feel right at home. Some of you are actually curious if there's anything that the iPhone 10 does better than anything in the current iPhone 14 series, in which case there's not a lot, but one thing that I will give credit to the iPhone 10 for, this still has a feature that I really loved and appreciated called 3D Touch. So the display can measure the actual amount of force you're exerting into the screen, which is particularly useful for the lock screen toggles because an issue I had with my 13 Pro Max and of course phones prior to that one is that sometimes if my lock screen comes on and I accidentally am holding my phone in a weird way my finger will accidentally trigger the flashlight and because on the newer phones they can't tell the difference between a long press and a hard press the flashlight would oftentimes come on when I didn't need it to but with this phone if I just rest my finger there nothing happens I have to intentionally push hard on the flashlight in order to get it to engage 
gauge. So that allows me to be a little bit more precise with toggles like that, as well as being able to move the cursor with the keyboard. You no longer just have to hold down on the space bar. Now you can just press hard anywhere on the keyboard and you can move around the cursor the way you want. And yes, I got to admit, it's been kind of nice having that back. And I'm trying not to fall too much in love with it because I know that I'm not going to have that on future generations of iPhone because obviously I'm not going to have this phone forever. But with the current time I'm using it, I'm like, yeah, you know what? This is kind of nice. Although I will admit that even though there's still ways to activate 3D Touch on the home screen with apps, even on iOS 16, they still let you do that. But I don't find it saving me that much time. And because it's just kind of the toggles and the keyboard thing, I get why Apple removed 3D Touch. I don't think it's coming back. But in the meantime, it's nice to have it when it's needed. Something else that really hasn't changed all that much on the newer generations compared to the iPhone 10 is Face ID. It still works like a charm. I set it up the same exact way I did on my 13 Pro Max and 14 Pro Max. And it unlocks very, very quickly. The one difference is it won't unlock in landscape mode like the new iPhones will. But iOS is not very landscape friendly. I mean, your home screen doesn't even do that. So I don't find myself in a ton of situations where I need to unlock Face ID in landscape mode. But it still works very, very well from a decent distance. I don't notice myself having to hold the phone closer than before or anything. And it works in the dark, of course. It's just reliable and helpful for Apple Pay and logging into banking apps and all that kind of thing. It still works flawlessly and it's the exact same unit. It's not any different from the Face ID sensors I used on launch day back in 2017. But one more advantage I will credit the iPhone 10 for compared to my last iPhone, the 13 Pro Max, is this is just so much more comfortable to hold. I really found myself missing that rounded chassis once I got over the whole squared off edge design being the latest and greatest fashion trend. Now I'm like, you know what? I, I do actually prefer this quite a bit. And on top of that, it's just so much lighter, mostly due to the size. And it's definitely not as thick as the new iPhones are. And the camera bump is a heck of a lot less intrusive than the giant ever-growing tumor that is the iPhone stovetops. Those things just keep getting thicker and thicker and my 13 Pro Max had just the worst wobble whereas this a lot more manageable. Very very thin camera bump on the back which is funny because when the iPhone 10 came out we all thought the camera bump was crazy and insanely big but now it actually looks quite reasonable. And on top of that this is the first time I've ever had an iPhone 10 or any rounded iPhone in combination with an Apple Watch Series 7. Both of these being kind of the graphite slash stainless steel it's all kind of gray but glossy and having that rounded chassis actually match each other it almost feels like the series 7 and the iphone 10 go together better than my 13 pro max and apple watch series 7 did because difference in chassis design but that's just a nitpicky thing for people like me and i'm not really planning on downgrading my apple watch at this time but i do think they kind of go hand in hand together they make an excellent combo they're still compatible and all of the features of the apple watch are still working even with the iphone 10 which is great but that's enough good things. Let's talk about some of the downsides of the iPhone 10 in 2023. Most common question I was getting was about battery life because even on day one in 2017, everyone was really quick to say, you know, the iPhone 10 for being the most expensive iPhone still doesn't have that great a battery life. And on top of that, even though this is the second battery for this iPhone 10 to sports, it's still at 84% battery health at the time of recording this. And yeah, I'm noticing in the battery settings that for one, this thing is not kicking on to optimize battery charging, even though I'm charging it at around the same times every day. It still loves to charge straight to 100% every chance it gets, and it's kind of struggling to hit four hours of screen on time, which is quite the downgrade compared to my 13 Pro Max, which could easily get me like 10 hours of screen on time. I'm doing some things to kind of help improve battery life by having like a pure black wallpaper, and my lock screen text is all dark, dark gray, so thanks to the OLED display not turning on pixels that don't need to be on, I do think that this particular lock screen is making me get better battery life than I would otherwise, but yeah, usually a little bit under the four hour screen on time point, which is not great, but I accepted that I was going to be okay with living with that because I work from home, so there's always chargers at my desk, and when I'm away from home, I usually spend a lot of time in my car, and my car has wireless charging, so I have access to chargers, and I have battery banks and stuff that are very small and easy to keep in the car when necessary, so yeah. Yes, the battery life is much worse than even the iPhone 12 mini, which people thought was terrible, but I still think it's pretty manageable. And I mentioned in my reviews of the Max iPhones in the past that I was not killing those phones on a single day. So it kind of felt like overkill for me. I was buying this phone and at the end of the day, it would be like 65, 70%. And then once I was battling with more smartphone addiction, 
in and getting rid of all my social media apps. On my 13 Pro Max, there was actually several days where I would be going to bed and I'd be like, what's my battery at? And it's like 85, 90% because it spent some time charging in the car or I just didn't use my phone that much that day. So if your lifestyle requires you to be away from chargers for extended periods, yeah, I can understand this being a problem, but my lifestyle makes it very, very possible to just be like, yeah, just top off if you need it. But for the most part, in the past three weeks, it's never died on me prematurely. I've never been stranded somewhere like, oh no, my phone is dead because I've got chargers around, which is cool. But that's one of the reasons I think the iPhone 10 is one of the furthest back iPhones I could downgrade to because wireless charging is what I use on the regular. I charge it that way overnight with MagSafe Duo. Even though the iPhone 10 does not have MagSafe, it will still receive a charge from a MagSafe charger. You just got to be a little bit more careful with how you align it. Honestly, since the ring is kind of right there and you have to know how to drop the iPhone on it, it's not that hard. I've yet to have a time where I wake up the next day and go, oh no, I didn't align my iPhone properly. No, I just make sure it's kind of right there in the center. It's pretty easy. You don't get the same satisfying MagSafe animation, but it still charges fine overnight. And if you really, really care about MagSafe, I just want to remind everybody that there are cases you can buy online that fit the iPhone 10, 10s, or 11 that add MagSafe back to that case. Like, it's not that complicated of a technology. The only reason I haven't gotten one of those is just because, again, I haven't had any issues just dropping my iPhone 10 on MagSafe Duo, and I'm not a case guy. I prefer using the iPhone caseless, and I like the way it feels the way it came out of the box, and that's kind of what this is. So, I'm not willing to spend extra money just to have a MagSafe ring, especially because the Apple logo is not centered, so it would look kind of weird to have the ring not around the logo and everything. I'm weird that way. Don't do what I do. I'm just kind of picky when it comes to the overall appearance of the device and things, but it feels much more comfortable in my hand without a case, and I just don't drop my phone, thankfully. But I think I'm still talking too much about things I like, so let's go the real bad in 2023, which is the iPhone 10 camera. So I will admit, in well-lit environments from the main sensor, it's still a pretty great camera. You can capture a lot of detail, and as you can see with my blue steel, there's still a lot of sharpness out of this sensor when provided the right amount of light. Still 12 megapixels on this thing, just like many iPhones that came past it, but the biggest difference that I think most people will notice when downgrading from an iPhone 13 Pro or 14 Pro to an iPhone 10 is dynamic range in the camera. That has by far been the biggest drawback of switching to this camera, but you can notice it even in daylight pictures. If there's just a little bit of shade, it captures so little detail out of that image, which isn't a deal breaker for me because I don't take a ton of pictures on my phone anyway. But if you care about little details like that, like, oh, wait a minute, I can't get enough detail out of that shade because of how terrible the dynamic range is with this camera, then that may be a reason to not downgrade this far. There was definitely a lot of HDR improvements on the 10s, 11, definitely in the 12 and 13. And of course, now you got pro raw and everything on the 14 pros, but that's a moving target. If your goal is just to have the best camera possible, there's basically no way around it, you're gonna have to upgrade every single year because every year the iPhone camera gets better and better and better and that's what gets the most amount of focus year over year generationally. But if you're not that much of a pixel peeper and you're like me and you kind of accept, hey, all of the pictures I'm gonna be posting are gonna be compressed to heck on Instagram or on Twitter, you're not gonna preserve that much raw quality on social media anyway. So I've recorded things that I've posted online with my iPhone 10, and I rarely see anyone bring it up. What's actually been more funny is seeing a lot of people say, hey, I could tell this was shot on your iPhone 10, but it wasn't. Like, they're commenting that on other videos that were shot on the iPhone 13, or even videos that were shot with my Blackmagic camera, which I guess is everyone's just way of saying I'm not that great of videoing things, but I don't care. The point is, you can't tell which iPhone I'm recording off of. That's all the comments have basically proven to me, and unless I bring it up directly, people won't comment on it. I did the whole live stream experiment with that, and switching from the iPhone 13 Pro camera to the iPhone 10 camera as my live stream angle, no one noticed anything until after I told them. So to me, that passes the YouTube compression test of, yeah, there's some differences, but most people aren't going to care. The one thing I did get back with the iPhone 10 was the 2X telephoto lens, which at first I thought, you know, 3X is sometimes a little bit too far. 2X feels just about right for me, but truthfully, I forgot how soft and how poor the sensor size is for the telephoto lens. Keep in mind, 
this was only the second generation iPhone that actually had a telephoto lens. It's just not that sharp, especially if you try to take portrait mode photos. That's where you see the most amount of improvement from a 11 chip machine learning versus, you know, a 15 or a 16 chip machine learning. iPhone 10 was just not great at masking out bokeh or getting that much detail out of a shot. So there has been a couple instances when I've been like, ooh, let me take a portrait mode photo on the iPhone 10. And it's just like, yeah, probably just don't do it. It just looks so artificial. It looks so fake. Your best bet is just using the main sensor. And if you're just zooming in on something far away and trying to get as much detail as possible, that's where I guess the telephoto lens is better than nothing, but it's really not much better than nothing. That's why in poorly lit situations, it won't even activate the telephoto lens. So I still would have downgraded even if there was just one lens on the back. I don't think that telephoto is doing us many favors. But one thing I do appreciate about having a more minimal camera setup on the back, and it came up a lot in my ownership of the 13 Pro Max. Anytime I'm trying to take a picture of something not too far away, the macro lens, you know, the ultra wide, is very quick to activate, and it's a lot softer. It's not as sharp of an image, and there's a lot more noise. So oftentimes, I would be trying to take a picture of food or something just close by, and on the 13 Pro, it would constantly want to activate. Okay, macro mode, time for macro. And it's like, no, no, and I have to press that little flower button again over and over again. Like, don't switch to macro. I just want it from the main sensor. But I don't have that problem on this phone. I can actually get pretty close with the main sensor and still keep it in focus. And I don't have to worry about disengaging the macro lens all the time. Sometimes you want to do a macro shot, but most of the time I feel like that's activating when it doesn't need to. And that little annoyance from my 13 Pro is gone here. See, every time I talk about how bad something is, I find myself turning it into a positive. But that's kind of the beauty of reviewing older tech is you can start to see kind of the silver lining or the space gray lining, I guess, around the edges. I'm sorry, I gotta stop with those. But you just gotta appreciate here this phone is gonna turn six years old later and it's still able to record video at 4K at 60. Like, that is an insane amount of detail to be captured in such a small, such a compact form factor, especially knowing that there are phones like this, which you can buy on eBay for like 200 bucks and it can record 4K at 60 as long as you want to. You know, other Android phones back in the day, they either couldn't record 4K at 60, or if they did, they could only do it for like 5 minutes or 10 minutes before the phone would heat up and then shut off. Whereas I have recorded a couple videos on this phone at 4K at 60 for well over 10 minutes, and there's no Android phone that could do that in 2017, and probably not that many that could do it from 2018 either, but I'm still doing it now in 2023, it's still working. And on that note, talking about how the iPhone 10 has aged in terms of responsiveness, that's where I want to give a lot of credit to the A11 chip, you know? There's a ton of people out there that will buy one phone over another because, well, this one has A16, this one has A15, but this is a pretty old chip, and yet everything still is very responsive and snappy. I believe there was only three gigs of RAM on this phone back in the day, and the apps still launch very, very quickly. I don't get a lot of freezes in the OS. Again, I'm not doing anything too complicated. I've done some light video editing with LumaFusion on the iPhone 10, and I was impressed with how well it played back everything and exported videos pretty fast. And sure, because of that lower RAM, a lot of the time the apps have to be reopened when you go into multitasking and open them again. But coming from a 13 Pro Max, I can't really say I noticed the phone behaving that much substantially slower than I did on my 13 Pro. I don't know if it's just because I'm a laid back, somewhat patient guy. So maybe I don't notice it all that much, but still, I'm just overly impressed with how responsive the user interface is. It doesn't feel like it's dropping frames or anything. Considering how old this phone is, it has aged incredibly well for doing a lot of the basic stuff, whether that be a FaceTime call, opening apps, opening the camera, checking email, multitasking, everything just zooms and flies just perfectly. So I'm very happy about that. That was probably one of my biggest concerns downgrading this phone is maybe there's an overall responsiveness that I'm enjoying on my newer iPhone that I won't realize is gone until I downgrade. Nope, that's not the case. It's still very snappy, very responsive. So good job, A11 chip, still running the latest version of iOS and I think it'll probably run iOS 17, where you may notice a bit more degradation though when you downgrade this far is when it comes to cellular speeds. But I think there's more to this puzzle than just the phone being old because for one, they're still using the Intel modems back then. They hadn't made the switch to Qualcomm. Apple switched to the far superior Qualcomm modems with the iPhone 12 series, which not only enabled 5G, which of course we've heard a billion times, but even if you turned off 5G on your newer iPhone like I did, the 4G speed were typically faster on those modems as well. So I've done some speed tests. I get about two bars at my house. And of course there's no 5G on this phone and it's still able to pull 
a decent amount of download. Again, I have Mint Mobile, and this is going to depend on your location and all that. But it was able to clock over 70 megabits down, but the upload was where it suffered. It wasn't really able to do much more than 2 megabits, which for some people is definitely a deal breaker if you're doing a lot of online gaming with your phone. That might be something to steer away from with the iPhone 10 series. But for someone like me that's mostly using my phone for watching YouTube videos, streaming music, or calling people, or texting people, 70 to 80 megabits download is still plenty. I think if we weren't doing side-by-side -side comparisons, people would have a lot harder time noticing the difference in speed. So yeah, sometimes when I open a website, it takes like four seconds to load instead of two seconds. That may be a deal breaker for some of you, but a guy like me, again, mostly pretty patient. So sometimes a web page might take a little bit longer, but it's not like night and day longer. Like on my old phone in this one part of town, I remember it taking two seconds to load the site and now it takes 60 seconds. Everything is just the difference of a couple seconds, which again, looks really good in a side-by-side, -side, but if you're on a budget, I definitely still think that 4G is still usable, but I definitely think that carriers are throttling or at least deprioritizing their 4G networks because I've done speed tests in the past in the same network on the same towers with the same phones and over time seen the speeds change drastically as 5G has become more widespread. My wife being a classic example, you know, when she first got her phone, 5G on iPhones weren't a thing yet and she was clocking well over 100 megabits download. Now on that same phone, it's struggling to get much more than 70 or 80 megabits download. So I can tell that there's some back end foolery going on from the carriers to try to get people to make sure, hey, you better move on to the 5G standard, get a 5G phone, right? And there's a wonderful selection of 5G iPhones to choose from at our website. But as much as I complain about all that, there's really nothing we can do about it. The point is, it's not unusably slow. Like, I still stream music just fine. I still watch YouTube videos, no problem. I'm sure it would be faster if it had 5G, but it's still usable. And the last thing I'll point out in regards to hardware is definitely that the speaker quality is not as clear and it definitely doesn't get as loud as my 13 Pro does, but it's a smartphone speaker. How clear can you expect it to get? I'm just glad that it's a stereo pair because that's one thing that really bothers me on older phones, having all the sound just come from one side. This still has the sound come pretty symmetrically out of both ends, so when you're watching a video on landscape, you still get a lot of that volume out of it. Not as good as what I was used to on my 13 Pro, but definitely not a deal breaker for me. It's loud enough, it's clear enough, and there's a lot more things I could talk about with the iPhone 10 in terms of iOS 16 and how it's running, but this video is getting a little long, so I think we'll save that for a different, more software-focused video about what the iPhone 10 still can do and what it can't do. But thank you to everybody supporting this channel directly on Talos of Tech Pro. Seriously, helps us out a ton, as does just watching these videos, so thanks again, and have an excellent rest of your day. <laughs>